Welcome. I'm Jack Welch, and I'm glad, but overwhelmed, to share with you something truly extraordinary from the astonishing life of the Prophet Joseph Smith. My grandfather's grandfather was another John Welch. He came to Nauvoo, Illinois in 1842, and two years later was one of the many young men who stood guard there in the city of Joseph over the bodies of Joseph and Hiram after they had been murdered about 20 miles away in the Carthage jail. Five years before that, in March 1839, Joseph and Hiram had managed to survive five months of torturous treatment in another jail, in a Missouri town ironically called Liberty. On Wednesday, March 20, Joseph wrote a 7,400-word-long letter, out of which Doctrine and Covenants sections 121, 122, and 123 have been excerpted. Joseph's letter, of course, is not the only letter written from a prison, but it certainly ranks among the most impressive. Martin Luther King's famous letter was written during a nine-day sentence in Birmingham jail in April 1963. Its 7,000 words were written on scraps of newspaper and jailhouse toilet paper and became extremely influential in the emerging American civil rights movement. In the year 524, a very influential philosopher and political advisor of that day named Boethius was convicted of treason in Italy. Before he was executed, he wrote from prison a famous philosophical dialogue on the nature of evil, free will, and divine providence topics that would also be on Joseph Smith's mind in 1839. The Apostle Paul was under protective custody for 18 months in Caesarea, where he may well have written letters of encouragement or of legal defense, and then he was held under house arrest in Rome, where he wrote letters to the Philippians, to Philemon, and reputedly also to the Ephesians and Colossians. Joseph Smith's letter from Liberty Jail certainly ranks alongside the most famous letters ever written by people wrongfully imprisoned. Dean Jesse and I published the full original text of this letter in the year 2000 in BYU Studies with notes and introductory summaries where it is still readily available on the web. Following my reading of its introductory paragraph, I want to share with you the experience of hearing this entire letter. Imagine yourself being Emma Smith, to whom the letter was first to be delivered, or imagine yourself as Bishop Partridge, having fled with the saints from Missouri to Illinois and having now no idea how things were going for Joseph Smith, Hiram, and the three others who remained in Liberty Jail with them. Or if you would ever see them again. Imagine yourself being a weary, frozen member of the church and how this letter mixes despair and hope, anger and love, ideals and realities, tough times and testimonies. And now, the introductory paragraph from the BYU Studies publication. While Joseph Smith was incarcerated in Liberty Jail from December 1, 1838 to April 6, 1839, he wrote or dictated eight surviving letters. Four of them were addressed to Emma, his wife, and all of them display the sterling character of the Prophet Joseph under trials of the most extreme conditions imaginable. His letter of March 20, 1839, directed to the Church of Latter-day Saints at Quincy, Illinois, and scattered abroad, and to Bishop Partridge in particular, is one of the most revealing and most significant letters ever written by a prophet of God in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Embedded in the 7,400 words of this lengthy letter, which was written in two parts on 29 sheets of paper, are six blocks of words now contained in sections 121 to 23 
of the Doctrine and Covenants. These shifts back and forth in the text will be indicated as we go along in this reading. Reading the words of those revelations in their original textual and historical context certainly enhances and highlights the impressive spiritual messages of these texts. Liberty Jail, Clay County, Missouri, March 20, 1839. To the Church of Latter-day Saints at Quincy, Illinois, and scattered abroad, and to Bishop Partridge in particular. Your humble servant, Joseph Smith, Jr., prisoner for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the saints, taken and held by the power of mobocracy, under the exterminating reign of His Excellency the Governor Lilburn W. Boggs, in company with his fellow prisoners and beloved brethren, Caleb Baldwin, Lyman White, Hiram Smith, and Alexander McRae, send you all greeting. May the grace of God the Father and of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rest upon you all and abide with you forever. May knowledge be multiplied unto you by the mercy of God. May faith and virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and charity be in you and abound, that you may not be barren in anything nor unfruitful. For inasmuch as we know that the most of you are well acquainted with the wrongs and the high-handed injustice and cruelty that are practiced upon us, whereas we have been taken prisoners charged falsely with every kind of evil and thrown into prison, enclosed with strong walls, surrounded with a strong guard, who continually watch day and night as indefatigable as the devil does in tempting and laying snares for the people of God. Therefore, dearly beloved brethren, we are the more ready and willing to lay claim to your fellowship and love. For our circumstances are calculated to awaken our spirits to a sacred remembrance of everything, and we think that yours are also, and that nothing therefore can separate us from the love of God and fellowship one with another, and that every species of wickedness and cruelty practice upon us will only tend to bind our hearts together and seal them together in love. We have no need to say to you that we are held in bonds without cause, neither is it needful that you say unto us, we are driven from our homes and smitten without cause. We mutually understand that if the inhabitants of the state of Missouri had let the saints alone and had been as desirable of peace as they were, there would have been nothing but peace and quietude in the state unto this day. We should not have been in this hell surrounded with demons. If not those who are damned, they are those who shall be damned. And where we are compelled to hear nothing but blasphemous oaths and witness a scene of blasphemy with drunkenness and hypocrisy and debaucheries of every description. And again, the cries of orphans and widows would not have ascended up to God against them, nor would innocent blood have stained the soil of Missouri. But, oh, the unrelenting hand, the inhumanity and murderous disposition of this people, it shocks all nature. It beggars and defies all description. It is a tale of woe, a lamentable tale, yea, a sorrowful tale, too much to tell, too much for contemplation, too much for human beings. It cannot be found among the heathens. It cannot be found among the nations where kings and tyrants are enthroned. It cannot be found among the savages of the wilderness, yea, and I think it cannot be found among the wild and ferocious beasts of the forest that a man should be mangled for sport, women robbed of all that they have, their last morsel for subsistence, 
and then be violated to gratify the hellish desires of the mob, and finally left to perish, with their helpless offspring clinging around their necks. But this is not all. After a man is dead, he must be dug up from his grave and mangled to pieces for no other purpose than to gratify their spleen against the religion of God. They practice these things upon the saints who have done them no wrong, who are innocent and virtuous, who love the Lord their God and are willing to forsake all things for Christ's sake. These things are awful to relate. But they are verily true. It must needs be that offenses come, but woe unto them by whom they come. O God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? How long shall thy hand be stayed? And thine eye, yea, thy pure eye, behold from the eternal heavens the wrongs of thy people and of thy servants, and thy ear be penetrated with their cries. Yea, O Lord, how long shall they suffer these wrongs and unlawful oppressions before thine heart shall be softened towards them and thy bowels be moved with compassion towards them? O Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven, earth, and seas, and of all things that in them are, and who controllest and subjectest the devil, and the dark and benighted dominion of Sheol, stretch forth thy hand, let thine eyes pierce, let thy pavilion be taken up, let thy hiding place no longer be covered, let thine ear be inclined, let thine heart be softened, and thy bowels moved with compassion towards us. Let thine anger be kindled against our enemies, and in the fury of thine heart, with thy sword avenge us of our wrongs. Remember thy suffering saints, O our God, and thy servants will rejoice in thy name forever. Dearly and beloved brethren, we see that perilous times have come, as was testified of, we may look, then, with most perfect assurance for the fulfillment of all those things that have been written, and with more confidence than ever before, lift up our eyes to the luminary of day, and say in our hearts, Soon thou wilt veil thy blushing face. He that said, Let there be light, and there was light, hath spoken this word, and again, thou moon, thou dimmer light, thou luminary of night, shall turn to blood. We shall see that everything is being fulfilled, and that the time soon shall come when the Son of Man shall descend in the clouds of heaven. Our hearts do not shrink, neither are our souls altogether broken by the grievous yoke which is put upon us. We know that God will have our oppressors in derision, that he will laugh at their calamity and mock when their fear cometh. Oh, that we could be with you, brethren, and unbosom our feelings unto you. We would tell that we should have been liberated at the time Elder Rigdon was, on the writ of habeas corpus, had not our own lawyers interpreted the law contrary to what it reads against us, which prevented us from introducing our evidence before the mock court. They have done us much harm from the beginning. They have of late acknowledged that the law was misconstrued and tantalized our feelings with it, and have entirely forsaken us, and have forfeited their oaths and their bonds. And we have a comeback on them, for they are co-workers with the mob. As nigh as we can learn, the public mind has been for a long time turning in our favor, and the majority is now friendly, and the lawyers can no longer browbeat us by saying that this or that is a matter of public opinion, for public opinion 
is not willing to brook it. For it is beginning to look with feelings of indignation against our oppressors and to say that the Mormons were not in the fault in the least. We think that truth, honor, virtue, and innocence will eventually come out triumphant. We should have taken a habeas corpus before the high judge and escaped the mob in a summary way. But unfortunately for us, the timber of the wall being very hard, our auger handles gave out and hindered us longer than we had expected. We applied to a friend and a very slight, incautious act gave rise to some suspicions. And before we could fully succeed, our plan was discovered. We had everything in readiness but the last stone, and we could have made our escape in one minute and should have succeeded admirably had it not been for a little imprudence or over-anxiety on the part of our friend. The sheriff and jailer did not blame us for our attempt. It was a fine breach and cost the county a round sum, but public opinion says that we ought to have been permitted to have made our escape. That then the disgrace would have been on us, but now it must come on the state. That there cannot be any charge sustained against us, and that the conduct of the mob, the murders committed at Hans Mills, and the exterminating order of the governor, and the one-sided rascally proceedings of the legislature have damned the state of Missouri to all eternity. I would just name also that General Atkinson has proved himself as contemptible as any of them. We have tried for a long time to get our lawyers to draw us some petitions to the supreme judges of this state, but they utterly refused. We have examined the law and drawn the petitions ourselves and have obtained abundance of proof to counteract all the testimony that was against us, so that if, if the Supreme Judge does not grant us our liberty, he has to act without cause, contrary to honor, evidence, law, or justice, surely to please the devil, but we hope better things and trust before many days God will so order our cause that we shall be set at liberty and take up our habitation with the saints. We received some letters last evening, one from Emma, one from Don Carlos Smith, and one from Bishop Partridge, all breathing a kind and consoling spirit. We were much gratified with their contents. We had been a long time without information, and when we read those letters, they were to our souls as the gentle air is refreshing. But our joy was mingled with grief because of the sufferings of the poor and much injured saints. And we need not say to you that the floodgates of our hearts were lifted and our eyes were a fountain of tears. But those who have not been enclosed in the walls of prison without cause or provocation can have but little idea how sweet the voice of a friend is. One token of friendship from any source, whatever awakens and calls into action every sympathetic feeling. It brings up in an instant everything that is past. It seizes the present with the avidity of lightning. It grasps after the future with the fierceness of a tiger. It moves the mind backward and forward from one thing to another until finally all enmity, malice, and hatred, and past differences, misunderstandings, and mismanagements are slain victorious at the feet of hope. And when the heart is sufficiently contrite, then the voice of inspiration steals along and whispers, My son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment, and then if thou endure it well, 
God shall exalt thee on high. Thou shalt triumph over all thy foes, thy friends do stand by thee, and they shall hail thee again with warm hearts and friendly hands. Thou art not yet as Job. Thy friends do not contend against thee, neither charge thee with transgression as they did Job. And they who do charge thee with transgression, their hopes shall be blasted, and their prospects shall melt away as the hoarfrost melteth before the burning rays of the rising sun. And also that God hath set his hand and seal to change the times and seasons, and to blind their minds, that they may not understand his marvelous workings, that he may prove them also and take them in their own craftiness, also because their hearts are corrupted and the things which they are willing to bring upon others and love to have others suffer may come upon themselves to the very uttermost, that they may be disappointed also, and their hopes may be cut off, and not many years hence, that they and their posterity shall be swept from under heaven, saith God, that not one of them is left to stand by the wall. Cursed are all those that shall lift up the heel against mine anointed, saith the Lord, and cry that they have sinned when they have not sinned before me, saith the Lord, but have done that which was meet in mine eyes, and which I commanded them. But those who cry transgression do it because they are the servants of sin, and are the children of disobedience themselves. And those who swear falsely against my servants, that they might bring them into bondage and death, woe unto them, because they have offended my little ones. They shall be severed from the ordinances of mine house. Their baskets shall not be full, and their houses and their barns shall perish, and they themselves shall be despised by those that flattered them. They shall not have right to the priesthood, nor their posterity after them from generation to generation. It had been better for them that a millstone had been hanged around their necks, and they drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto all those that discomfort my people and drive and murder and testify against them, saith the Lord of hosts. A generation of vipers shall not escape the damnation of hell. Behold, mine eyes see and know all their works, and I have in reserve a swift judgment in the season thereof for all of them. For there is a time appointed for every man according as his works shall be. And now, beloved brethren, I say unto you that inasmuch as God hath said that he would have a tried people, that he would purge them as gold, now we think that this time he has chosen his own crucible wherein we have been tried. And we think if we get through with any degree of safety and shall have kept the faith, that it shall be a sign to this generation altogether sufficient to leave them without excuse. We also think it will be a trial of our faith equal to that of Abraham, and that the ancients will not have whereof to boast over us in the day of judgment, as being called to pass through heavier afflictions, that we may hold an even weight in the balance with them. But now, after having suffered so great sacrifice and having passed through so great a season of sorrow, we trust that a ram may be caught in the thicket speedily to relieve the sons and daughters of Abraham from their great anxiety and to light up the lamp of salvation upon their countenances, that they may hold on now after having gone so far unto everlasting life. Now, brethren, concerning the places for the location of the saints, we cannot counsel you as we would if we were present with you. And as to the things that were written heretofore, we did not consider them anything very binding. Therefore, we now say once for all that we think it most proper that the general affairs of the church, which are necessary to be considered, 
while your humble servant remains in bondage, should be transacted by a general conference of the most faithful and the most respectable of the authorities of the Church. And a minute of those transactions may be kept and forwarded from time to time to your humble servant. And if there should be any corrections by the word of the Lord, they shall be freely transmitted. And your humble servant will approve all things whatsoever is acceptable unto God. If anything should have been suggested by us, or any names mentioned except by commandment, or thus saith the Lord, we do not consider it binding. Therefore our hearts shall not be grieved if different arrangements should be entered into. Nevertheless, we would suggest the propriety of being aware of an aspiring spirit, which spirit has oftentimes urged men forward to make foul speeches and influence the church to reject milder counsels, and has even been the means of bringing much death and sorrow upon the church. We would say, Beware of pride also, for well and truly hath the wise man said that pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before the fall. And again, outward appearance is not always a criterion by which to judge our fellow man. But the lips betray the haughty and overbearing imaginations of the heart. By his words and his deeds, let him be judged. Flattery also is a deadly poison. A frank and open rebuke provoketh a good man to emulation. And in an hour of trouble, he will be your best friend. But on the other hand, it will draw out all the corruptions of corrupt hearts and lying and the poison of asps under their tongues. And they do cause the pure heart to be cast into prison because they want them out of their way. A fanciful and flowery and heated imagination beware of, because the things of God are of deep import and time, and experience, and careful, and ponderous, and solemn thoughts can only find them out. Thy mind, O man, if thou wilt lead a soul unto salvation, must stretch as high as the utmost heavens, and search into and contemplate the darkest abyss, and the broad expanse of eternity. Thou must commune with God. How much more dignified and noble are the thoughts of God, than the vain imaginations of the human heart. None but fools will trifle with the souls of men. How vain and trifling have been our spirits, our conferences, our councils, our meetings, our private as well as public conversations, too low, too mean, too vulgar, too condescending for the dignified characters of the called and chosen of God, according to the purposes of His will, from before the foundation of the world. We are called to hold the keys of the mysteries of those things that have been kept hid from the foundation of the world until now. Some have tasted a little of these things, many of which are to be poured down from heaven upon the heads of babes, yea, upon the weak, obscure, and despised ones of the earth. Therefore, we beseech of you, brethren, that you bear with those who do not feel themselves more worthy than yourselves, while we exhort one another to a reformation with one and all, both old and young, teachers and taught, both high and low, rich and poor, bond and free, male and female. Let honesty and sobriety and candor and solemnity and virtue and pureness and meekness and simplicity Crown our heads in every place, and in fine, become as little children, without malice, guile, or hypocrisy. And now, brethren, after your tribulations, if you do these things and exercise fervent prayer and faith in the sight of God always, he shall give unto you knowledge by his Holy Spirit 
yea, by the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost, that has not been revealed since the world was until now, which our forefathers have waited with anxious expectation to be revealed in these last times, which their minds were appointed to by the angels, has held in reserve for the fullness of their glory, a time to come in which nothing shall be withheld. Whether they be one God or many gods, they shall be manifest. All thrones and dominions, principalities and powers shall be revealed and set forth upon all who have endured valiantly for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And also if there be bounds set to the heavens or to the seas or to the dry land or to the sun, moon, or stars, all the times of their revolutions, all the appointed days, months, and years, and all the days of their days, months, and years, and all their glories, laws, and set times shall be revealed in the day of the dispensation of the fullness of times, according to that which was ordained in the midst of the grand council of the eternal God of all other gods before this world was, that should be reserved unto the finishing and the end thereof, when every man shall enter into his eternal presence and into his immortal rest. But I beg leave to say unto you, brethren, that ignorance, superstition, and bigotry, placing itself where it ought not, is oft times in the way of the prosperity of this church, like the torrent of rain from the mountains that floods the most pure and crystal stream with mire and dirt and filthiness and obscures everything that was clear before, and all rushes along in one general deluge. But time weathers tide, and notwithstanding we are rolled in the mire of the flood for the time being, the next surge for adventure, as time rolls on, may bring to us the fountain as clear as crystal and as pure as snow. While the filthiness, floodwood, and rubbish is left and purged out by the way, how long can rolling water remain impure? What power shall stay the heavens? As well might a man stretch forth his puny arm to stop the Missouri River in its decreed course, or to turn it upstream as to hinder the Almighty from pouring down knowledge from heaven upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. What is Boggs, or his murderous party, but wimbling willows upon the shore to catch the floodwood? As well might we argue that water is not water because the mountain torrents send down mire and roil the crystal stream, although afterwards render it more pure than before, or that fire is not fire because of a quenchable nature by pouring on the flood, or to say that our cause is down because renegades, liars, priests, thieves, and murderers who are all alike tenacious of their crafts and creeds have poured down from their spiritual wickedness in high places and from their strongholds of the devil a flood of dirt and mire and filthiness and vomit upon our heads. No, God forbid. Hell may pour forth its rage like the burning lava of Mount Vesuvius or of Etna or of the most terrible of the burning mountains, and yet shall Mormonism stand. Water, fire, truth, and God are all realities. Truth is Mormonism. God is the author of it. He is our shield. It is by him we received our birth. It was by his voice that we were called to a dispensation of his gospel in the beginning of the fullness of times. It was by him we received the Book of Mormon. And it is by him that we remain unto this day, and by him we shall remain, if it shall be for our glory. And in his almighty name we are determined to endure tribulation as good soldiers unto the end. But brethren, we shall continue to offer further reflections in our next epistle. You will learn, by the time you have read this, and if you do not learn it, you may learn it, that walls and irons 
doors and creaking hinges, and half-scared-to-death guards and jailers, grinning like some damned spirits, lest an innocent man should make his escape to bring light the damnable deeds of a murderous mob, are calculated in their very nature to make the soul of an honest man feel stronger than the powers of hell. But we must bring our epistle to a close. We send our respects to fathers, mothers, wives, and children, brothers and sisters. We hold them in the most sacred remembrance. I send this epistle to Emma, that she may have the first perusal of it. We feel to inquire after Elder Rigdon, if he has not forgotten us. It has not been signified to us by his writing. Brother George W. Robinson also, and Elder Cahoon, we remember him, but we would like to jog his memory for a little on the fable of the bear and the two friends who mutually agreed to stand by each other. And perhaps it would not be amiss to mention Uncle John and various others. A word of consolation and a blessing would not come amiss from anybody while we are being so closely whispered by the bear. We feel to excuse everybody and everything. Yea, the more readily when we contemplate that we are in the hands of persons worse than a bear. For the bear would not prey upon a dead carcass. Our respects and love and fellowship to all the virtuous saints. We are your brethren and fellow sufferers and prisoners of Jesus Christ for the gospel's sake and for the hope of glory which is in us. Amen. Following a break, the epistle then resumes. We continue to offer further reflections to Bishop Partridge and to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, whom we love with a fervent love and do always bear them in mind in all our prayers to the throne of God. It still seems to bear heavily upon our minds that the Church would do well to secure for themselves the contract of the land which is proposed to them by Mr. Isaac Galland, and to cultivate the friendly feelings of that gentleman inasmuch as he shall prove himself to be a man of honor and a friend to humanity, and also Isaac Van Allen, Esquire, the Attorney General of Iowa Territory, and Governor Lucas, that peradventure such men may be wrought upon by the providence of God to do good unto his people. We really think that Mr. Gallon's letter breathes that kind of a spirit, if we may judge correctly. Governor Lucas also. We suggest the idea of praying fervently for all men who manifest any degree of sympathy for the suffering children of God. We think that the United States surveyor of the territory of Iowa may be of a great benefit to the church, if it be the will of God to this end. And righteousness should be manifested as the girdle of our loins. It seems to be deeply impressed upon our minds that the saints ought to lay hold of every door that shall seem to be opened unto them, to obtain foothold upon the earth and be making all the preparation that is within their power for terrible storms that are now gathering in the heavens, a day of clouds with darkness and gloominess and of thick darkness, as spoken of by the prophets, which cannot now be a long time lingering, for there seems to be a whispering that the angels of heaven who have been entrusted with the counsel of these matters for the last days, have taken counsel together and among the rest of the general affairs that have to be transacted in their honorable counsel, they have taken cognizance of the testimony of those who were murdered at Hans Mills and also those who were martyred with David W. Patton and elsewhere and have passed some decisions peradventure in favor of the saints and those who were called to suffer without cause. These decisions will be made known in their time, and the Council will take into consideration all those things that offend. 
We have a fervent desire that in your general conferences everything should be discussed with a great deal of care and propriety, lest you grieve the Holy Spirit, which shall be poured out at all times upon your heads when you are exercised with those principles of righteousness that are agreeable to the mind of God and are properly affected one toward another and are careful by all means to remember those who are in bondage and in heaviness and in deep afflictions for your sakes. And if there are any among you who aspire after their own aggrandizement and seek their own opulence, while their brethren are groaning in poverty and are under sore trials and temptations, they cannot be benefited by the intercession of the Holy Spirit, which maketh intercession for us day and night with groanings that cannot be uttered. We ought at all times to be very careful that such high-mindedness shall never have a place in our hearts, but condescend to men of low estate, and with all long-suffering bear the infirmities of the weak. Behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? Because their hearts are set so much upon the things of this world, and aspire to the honors of men that they do not learn this one lesson, that the rights of the priesthood are inseparably connected with the powers of heaven, and that the powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness. That they may be conferred upon us, it is true. But when we undertake to cover our sins or to gratify our pride or vain ambition or to exercise control or dominion or compulsion, Upon the souls of the children of men, in any degree of unrighteousness, behold, the heavens withdraw themselves. The Spirit of the Lord is grieved. And when it is withdrawn, amen to the priesthood or the authority of that man. Behold, ere he is aware, he is left unto himself to kick against the pricks, to persecute the saints, and to fight against God. We have learned by sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of almost all men as soon as they get a little authority, as they suppose, they will immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. Hence, many are called, but few are chosen. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile, reproving betimes with sharpness when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and then showing forth afterwards an increase of love toward him whom thou hast reproved, lest he esteem thee to be his enemy, that he may know that thy faithfulness is stronger than the cords of death." Let thy bowels also be full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith and virtue. Garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God. And the doctrine of the priesthood shall distill upon thy soul as the dews from heaven. The Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion and thy scepter an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth and thy dominion shall be an everlasting dominion, and without compulsory means it shall flow unto thee forever and ever. The ends of the earth shall inquire after thy name, and fools shall have thee in derision, and hell shall rage against thee, while the pure in heart, and the wise, and the noble, and the virtuous shall seek counsel and authority and blessings constantly from under thy hand, and thy people shall never be turned against thee by the testimony of traitors. And although their influence shall cast thee into trouble and into bars and walls, thou shalt be had in honor. And but for a small moment, and thy voice shall be more terrible in the midst of thine enemies than the fierce lion because of thy righteousness. And thy God shall stand by thee forever and ever if thou art called to pass through tribulations, if thou art in perils among false brethren, if thou art in peril among robbers, if thou art in perils by land or by sea, 
If thou art accused with all manner of false accusations, if thine enemies fall upon thee, if they tear thee from the society of thy father and mother and brethren and sisters, and if with drawn sword thy enemies tear thee from the bosom of thy wife and of thine offspring, and thine elder son, although but six years of age, shall cling to thy garment and shall say, My father, my father, why can't you stay with us? Oh, my father, what are the men going to do with you? And if then he shall be thrust from thee by the sword, and thou shalt be dragged to prison, and thine enemies prowl around like wolves for the blood of the Lamb, and if thou shouldest be cast into the pit or into the hands of murderers, and the sentence of death passed upon thee, and if thou be cast into the deep, if the billowing surge conspire against thee, if fierce winds become thine enemy, if the heavens gather blackness and all elements combine to hedge up the way, and above all, if the very jaws of hell shall gape open the mouth wide after thee, know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. The Son of Man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? Therefore hold on thy way, and the priesthood shall remain with thee, for their bounds are set, they cannot pass. Thy days are known, and thy years shall not be numbered less. Therefore fear not what man can do. For God shall be with you forever and ever. Now, brethren, I would suggest, for the consideration of the conference, it's being carefully and wisely understood by the council or conferences that our brethren scattered abroad, who understand the spirit of the gathering, that they fall into the places and refuge of safety that God shall open unto them between Kirtland and Far West. Those from the East and from the West and from far countries, let them fall in somewhere between those two boundaries, in the most safe and quiet places as they can find. And let this be the present understanding until God shall open a more effectual door for us for further consideration. And again, we further suggest for the considerations of the Council that there be no organization of large bodies upon common stock principles in property or of large companies or firms until the Lord shall signify it in a proper time and manner, as it opens such a dreadful field for the avaricious, the indolent, and the corrupt-hearted to prey upon the innocent and virtuous and honest. We have reason to believe that many things were introduced among the saints before God had signified the times, and notwithstanding the principles and plans may have been good, yet aspiring men, or in other words, men who had not the substance of godliness about them, perhaps undertook to handle edged tools. Children, you know, are fond of tools, while they are not yet able to use them. Time and experience, however, are the only safe remedies against such evils. There are many teachers, but perhaps not many fathers. There are times coming when God will signify many things which are expedient for the well-being of the saints. But the times have not yet come, but will come as fast as can be found place and reception for them. And again, we would suggest for your consideration the propriety of all the saints gathering up a knowledge of all the facts and sufferings and abuses put to them by the people of this state, and also all the property and amounts of damages which they have sustained, both of character and personal injuries, as well as real property, and also the names of all persons that have had a hand in their oppressions, as far as they can get hold of them and find them out. 
And perhaps a committee can be appointed to find out these things and to take statements and affidavits, and also to gather up the libelous publications that are afloat, and all that are in the magazines, and in the encyclopedias, and all the libelous histories that are published, and are writing, and by whom, and present the whole concatenation of diabolical rascality and nefarious and murderous impositions that have been practiced upon this people, that we may not only publish to all the world, but present them to the heads of government in all their dark and hellish hue, as the last effort which is enjoined on us by our Heavenly Father, before we can fully and completely claim the promise which shall call him forth from his hiding place, and also that the whole nation may be left without excuse before he can send forth the power of his mighty arm. It is an imperative duty that we owe to God, to angels with whom we shall be brought to stand, and also to ourselves, to our wives and children, who have been made to bow down with grief, sorrow, and care under the most damning hand of murder, tyranny, and oppression, supported and urged on and upheld by the influence of that spirit which hath so strongly riveted the creeds of the fathers who have inherited lies upon the hearts of the children and filled the world with confusion and has been growing stronger and stronger and is now the very mainspring of all corruption and the whole earth groans under the weight of its iniquity. It is an iron yoke. It is a strong band. They are the very handcuffs and chains and shackles and fetters of hell. Therefore, it is an imperative duty that we owe not only to our own wives and children, but to the widows and fatherless, whose husbands and fathers have been murdered under its iron hand, which dark and blackened deeds are enough to make hell itself shudder, and to stand aghast and pale, and the hands of the very devil to tremble and palsy. And also, it is an imperative duty that we owe to all the rising generation and to all the pure in heart, for there are many yet on the earth, among all sects, parties, denominations, who are blinded by the subtle craftiness of men. Therefore they lie in wait to deceive, and who are only kept from the truth, because they know not where to find it. Therefore that we should waste and wear out our lives in bringing to light all the hidden things of darkness, wherein we know them, and they are truly manifest from heaven. These should then be attended to with great earnestness. Let no man count them as small things, for there is much which lieth in futurity pertaining to the saints, which depends upon these things. You know, brethren, that a very large ship is benefited very much by a very small helm in the time of a storm, by being kept workways with the wind and the waves. Therefore, dearly beloved brethren, let us cheerfully do all things that lie in our power, and then may we stand with the utmost assurance to see the salvation of God and for his arm to be revealed. And again, I would further suggest the impropriety of the organization of bands or companies by covenant or oaths, by penalties or secrecies, but let the pastimes of our experiences and sufferings by the wickedness of Dr. Avard suffice and let our covenant be that of the everlasting covenant, as is contained in the Holy Writ and the things that God hath revealed unto us. Pure friendship always becomes weakened the very moment you undertake to make it stronger by penal oaths and secrecy. Your humble servant or servants intend from henceforth to disapprobate everything that is not in accordance with the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and is not of a bold and frank and upright nature. They will not hold their peace as in times past when they see iniquity beginning to rear its head for fear of traitors or 
consequences that shall follow by reproving those who creep in unawares, that they may get some with which to destroy the flock. We believe that the experience of the saints in times past has been sufficient, that they will from henceforth be always ready to obey the truth without having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. It is expedient that we should be aware of such things, and we ought always to be aware of those prejudices which sometimes so strangely present themselves and are so congenial to human nature against our friends, neighbors, and brethren of the world who choose to differ from us in opinion and in matters of faith. Our religion is between us and our God. Their religion is between them and their God. There is a love from God that should be exercised toward those of our faith who walk uprightly, which is peculiar to itself, but it is without prejudice. It also gives scope to the mind, which enables us to conduct ourselves with greater liberality toward all that are not of our faith than what they exercise towards one another. These principles approximate nearer to the mind of God because it is like God, or God-like. Here is a principle also which we are bound to exercise with, that is, in common with all men, such as governments and laws and regulations in the civil concerns of life. This principle guarantees to all parties, sects and denominations, and classes of religion equal, coherent, and indefeasible rights. They are things that pertain to this life. Therefore, all are alike interested. They make our responsibilities one towards another in matters of corruptible things, while the former principles do not destroy the latter but bind us stronger and make our responsibilities not only one to another but unto God also. Hence, we say that the Constitution of the United States is a glorious standard. It is founded in the wisdom of God. It is a heavenly banner. It is to all those who are privileged with the sweets of its liberty, like the cooling shades and refreshing waters of a great rock in a thirsty and weary land. It is like a great tree, under whose branches men from every clime can be shielded from the burning rays of the sun. We, brethren, are deprived of the protection of its glorious principles by the cruelty of the cruel, by those who only look for the time being for pasturage like the beasts of the field, only to fill themselves, and forget that the Mormons as well as the Presbyterians and those of every other class and description have equal rights to partake of the fruits of the great tree of our national liberty, But notwithstanding, we see what we see, and feel what we feel, and know what we know, yet that fruit is no less precious and delicious to our taste. We cannot be weaned from the milk, neither can we be driven from the breast, neither will we deny our religion because of the hand of oppression, but we will hold on until death. We say that God is true, that the Constitution of the United States is true, that the Bible is true, that the Book of Mormon is true, that the Book of Covenants is true, that Christ is true, that the ministering angels sent forth from God are true, that we know that we have an house not made with hands eternal in the heavens, whose builder and maker is God, a consolation which our oppressors cannot feel when fortune or fate shall lay its iron hand on them as it has on us. Now we ask, what is man? Remember, brethren, that time and chance happen to all men. We shall continue our reflections in our next. We subscribe ourselves 
your sincere friends and brethren in the bonds of the everlasting gospel, prisoners of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the gospel and the saints. We pronounce the blessings of heaven upon the heads of the saints who seek to serve God with undivided hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Signed, Joseph Smith, Jr., Hiram Smith, Lyman White, Caleb Baldwin, Alexander McRae. Addressed to Mrs. Emma Smith, Quincy, Illinois.